Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the meeting of the executive tonight. We'll go straight in. Um, I just warn for the large number of residents that are here <laughs> that this uh, uh, meeting will be filmed, but uh, only directed to the people that are sitting around the front. So first of all, apologies. Have we got any apologies? No, Chairman. Thank you. Minutes of previous meeting, pages 5 to 16. Anybody got any comments or corrections? No? Okay. Um, I have a vote to approve the minutes. Thank you. Any signature? Declarations of interest. I am non executive chairman and unpaid optimist, which gives me an interest in the until building is prejudicial. Thank you. I've got the personal interest because my husband is a non executive director of WBC in all the Thank you, Paulie. So we'll move straight on to the public question time. We've just got the one question. Peter, would you like to step up and ask the question? Thank you. Uh, in noting the paper proposing a vision for the future in respect of travelling to working, and may I first point out that elements in this paper derive from previous public realm workshops and consultations through ex an exhibition, these last being held in 2013. At a stakeholders meeting on 22nd of April this year about the development of the marketplace and the surrounding street environment, we were told that a report following those engagements had been intended to be made available to the public and on further inquiry, I was assured that it would indeed be put on the council website and stakeholders would be told where to find it. This has not happened and I would urge the executive member to ensure the early availability of this long overdue and important public document. But secondly, could I ask the executive member of the, uh, uh, the executive to include in the decision taken about the vision paper uh, agreement that in view of its importance as a matter of considerable significance, it be made available to the local community with a view to them knowing of and sharing in or being able to critique that vision so that future discussions about the town centre public realm can be guided by it. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Thank, thank you, Peter. I mean, the vision document seeks to set out a strategic approach to ensure that visitors to Wokenham have a choice about how they make the journey through a range of sustainable travel options and they have a positive experience when they arrive. Um, it's a very much a high level vision document, but all other third parties' interests will, of course, be taken into consideration as we move forward with initiatives within the town. This is why we've not come up with a straight jacketed policy. It's very flexible and it allows us to consider local comment as and when it arises. The document is open and loose, allowing local input as it, as it develops and goes through. Your question relating to the previous public realm work um, we undertook, and I thank you for bringing that to our attention, that the LDA public realm and design and delivery strategy is no longer available on the council's website. The planning pages of the website have been in the process of being refreshed, and now uh, they have been, I will ensure that the LDA document is reinstated as soon as possible. However, the information is available on request in the entry. Do you have a supplementary? Yeah, well, in the very point of clarification, I'm not certain we're talking about the same document. I had assumed that just as there was for the 2011 uh, public realm engagement, where a report from the, uh, the people who ran that session uh, then provided a report back to the public, a similar report back was, was going to be provided, and that's what I thought was available rather than a strategy document. I, I must admit, I'm, I'm not in favour of the original because at that point I wasn't involved in that and so I'm, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not quite clear what the references of that was. But this document uh, was agreed, or hopefully will be agreed, or was agreed on by spoken to officers and we've got it in a, in a format which will allow the modification of it as we go through the regeneration in the town centre. And that really is the, 
I feel the best way. So rather than having this very straight jacket policy um, on car parks that we've, that we've tended to have in the past, this will allow input from other areas such as town councils and also uh, other other interested societies and parties in the town. Peter, I know you've done a meeting, is it tomorrow with uh, Sarah Morgan? Yes. Yeah, I think if you raise questions with her, if there's more meat you require on those bones, I think the point is that she's covering a lot of that from the questions you've already asked. So if there's anything further, then it will be suitable to put questions in after that. But I think you'll find that she will give you quite a bit of information around that subject tomorrow. And then uh, if there's just anything remaining, maybe contact John or myself. That's all right. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item 19, member question time. We have got one question from the Councillor Rochelle Shepherd de Quay, who unfortunately couldn't make it, and we had arranged for Councillor Bray to put the question on her behalf. Um, unfortunately, Councillor Bray, unusually for her, is not here, so um, we'll respond to that in writing. So we move now on to item 20, travelling to Oakham Town Centre, a vision for the future 1728. And it's you, it's you, Thank you, thank you, Keith. Um, I mean, th this is a document, I mean, this is a report that, I, that outlined how the council is taking a strategic approach to, in, to, to ensure that visitors to Oakham have a choice about how they make their journey for a range of sustainable travel options. And, and, and will have a positive experience when they arrive with good quality environment for pedestrians, cyclists and the space to park their cars. I think the really important thing about it is that um, this vision sets out how we intend to deliver choice, but we do have to recognise that the car remains the primary means of travel for many. And, and so, so the whole policy around the fact that we've got the largest car ownership in the UK and the largest second car ownership in the UK, that has to recognise it. Um, I mean, if we continue to progress towards the regeneration of town centre, we recognise how important it is that those who come to work shop and enjoy the benefits of improved leisure and recreation facilities can do so easily, and that the choice to, about how they can do this. So this really, what I'm asking with this document is, I'm asking that the executive endorse the approach outlined in the Travel to Woking and Town Centre as our vision for the future is set out in uh, Appendix A. Uh, Philip? Thank you, Chairman. Um, interestingly, I attended the AGM of the Greater Library Residents Association on Monday night to talk about regeneration. And uh, in support of this paper, I, I actually gave them a broad outline of the, the strategy at that meeting. And it's fair to say that um, having discussed it reasonably uh, fairly, I think, across the board, they were very supportive, broadly, for it and welcomed it. So that's very good uh, positive news, particularly as they live in the town centre. Charlotte? Thank you, Chairman. Um, whilst I recognise that this is a high level um, vision document, um, when we are talking about new cycle paths, greenways, um, and uh, footpaths, etc., um, and we are taking them to the further stage of um, proposals. Um, I just wanted to ask that they are um, not necessarily set in stone and that they are um, they're taken out for consultation with engagement with community residents and in particular parents who will potentially be using them for routes to school and, and potentially new routes to new schools. Um, and the reason I ask this is recently we've been um, doing a lot of work with new footpaths to the um, Arbfields um, School in the South. And um, we've been working with the parent reference group there. And some of the proposals that officers have been working um, for quite a long time with and when they brought them to the parent reference group, um, parents there um, pointed out sort of quite, quite obvious things very early on with, with those routes that um, they, they said, you know, on paper it looks great, but actually in reality we wouldn't let our children use those routes for various different reasons. Um, and so, you know, things like lighting, crossings, and actually some, sometimes the routes just weren't in the right places because of uh, safeguarding and they wouldn't let the children use them at night. So um, I just asked that um, maybe, you know, we could just be very fluid about those later on. Um, I, I think one of the major planks or, or 
one of the building blocks of this is the fact that it isn't a straight-jacketed policy, which will allow a lot of input. I mean, I went to a meeting the other day um, with another council, and I can tell you we're very consultative, and uh, it was made very clear by all the people at that meeting. So, yes, is the answer to that. That's why it's fluid. Um, it's much like the regeneration. The regeneration has developed over time, and I think that having um, when when they when you submit the planning application, it tends with with the travel plans, they tend to be pretty rigid. This is a document that will sit over that and will allow uh, will allow residents to make comments other than just that that three minutes they get at the planning meeting, which I think is really important. So yes, is the answer. Thank you, John. Uh, I guess. <coughs> Thank you. Um, two, two sorts of things here. Um, John, can you assure us that as we move with the vision forward, we will be looking at the eventual 2026 position, hopefully earlier, where the Northern Relief Road and Southern Distributor Road will have open and therefore hopefully positively impacted on the traffic in, in the town centre. And the second one is, I see on page 27, talk about the rail station car park, uh, the comment would be close to capacity to accommodate rail-based car parking. I, I would hope that we would be still working with them to increase that, so even more people have the opportunity to go by rail, but also to park there rather than anywhere else in the town. Um, I, the answer to your first bit of your question is yes, Angus. I mean, with regards to the car parking around stations, um, we know that uh, we, we are going to do the Carnival Pool, um, and we were hoping that there was going to be some form of development at Twyford, which would be the responsibility of the train operators. Whether that changes after the announcements that we've heard today about the, the train, uh, we're having a bit of a change around there. Um, I don't know, but uh, again, one of the things that I, and I've already had conversations with, 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 with Reading Buses. Um, I'd like to think if we develop uh, our park and rides, that we will look at them as multi-destination park and rides. So you might, rather than have the buses necessarily stopping inside the park and ride, they may just drive past the outside. So you may be able to get a bus um, from Amen Corner, for instance, to Twyford Station. Um, and if we can make that financially attractive, a lot of people, rather than drive all the way to Twyford and spend six pounds a day, or do even worse and park outside somebody's house all day, um, and they will start to use the, these park and rides. So again, that flexibility is built into this thing. So, understand that, John, just point out um, that Twyford stations on one railway line working on a different totally different line, so there's a, a complementary need for track for parking. Thank you, Angus. Um, if I can just make a contribution yeah. as well. Uh, there was an intention of, uh, uh, for the station car park to be double-decked at some stage, but we also should seriously <coughs> consider not constraining the carnival pool as a potential um, <coughs> station car park, uh, which means all-day parking there. Uh, certainly, that we should look at that in a very serious way. Anthony? Yes, I like <laughs> that. Extra revenue. <laughs> very attractive. Um, a couple of things. Uh, uh, obviously, I do support Charlotte and the comments that she made about um, getting in early. Um, mm. I also um, read something a few years ago about the value of separation of cycleways and roads, um, particularly as cars tend to go faster than cyclists not to do that can have fatal consequences as has been found in London from time to time. So I, I would like to see the opportunity to, to get some of the new cycleways you know, away from the current road network. Um, uh, and then the other bit, I think Twyford Station, I think is something that we really do seriously have to look at parking and ensure that it happens for when Crossrail opens, because I think Crossrail potential is going to be a game changer. Um, whether people will really want to catch a bus from Ellen Corner to Twyford, I can I doubt it, but um, I therefore think that we uh, should be looking at uh, car parking and if we can make some money out of it, it'll be better. Yeah, again, um, what was your first bit? I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, I agreed with Charlotte. <laughs> oh, yeah, and then I linked into the separation of roads and so Oh, right, that's it. Yeah. I mean, um, it's very difficult with our existing road, where we have an existing road, to separate um, cyclists physically from. Um, you either have to stick them on the pavement, and then people moan about being knocked down by. And, and of course, these high speed cyclists don't want to go on the pavement, which is probably not a bad thing. Um, but where we are building a new road, that really is going to be what we're going to be looking at as an option. Actual separation between them and the traffic, because as you're right to say, cars and bikes don't mix. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Just to come back on two things. First of all, picking up on Anthony's comment about the separation of cyclists and uh, road users. Even over 50 years ago, the A64 from uh, York to Malton had a very good dual carriageway with uh, cycle paths on each side. I'm assured by one of the regeneration team who lives in that area that he was cycling on that very road only a few weeks ago and it's still maintained and it's still a very safe cycle path on a very busy uh, road across uh, to the east coast from uh, York. Secondly, when we're talking about servicing stations, I think it was just commented there about Twyford being on a different line. I would very much like to see a bus service running between Twyford Station and Wokingham Station direct because I think that would have a bigger impact than even the park and rides, moving people and preventing them from having to park at Wokingham Station. I think that would be very important to try and achieve that. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. The, the, the only issue with park and rides at the moment is we've got to be a bit careful that they don't get out of control. If you look uh, in, in Shinfield, they have a small car park there which tends to be used by people who are dropping their kids off to school. They suss that the leopard bus is the best way of getting them ready, so the car park's permanently full, because it's free. We need to get a machine in there <laughs> at some point, but it's, it, it, it's permanently full because people walk into the corner to get the leopard bus. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to be in the driving seat and controlling that, otherwise they will start popping up without our control. No pun intended. No. <laughs> Pauline and Julian, do you want to just make a full no, hand? No, I won't. <laughs> the error has been said. Just one comment on cycleways. The uh, physical separation of the lower end away from the main road does mean means that over the weekend certainly we've got lots of small kids with their parents cycling up and down that I'm pretty sure would not be anywhere near such a road if there wasn't that physical separation. So I'm very much in favour of anything we could do to do that anywhere else. Thank you. So um, let's move to the recommendation on page 17. So uh, the executive endorsed the approach. All those in favour, be sure. That's unanimous. So next item, Care Act 2014, changes to charging for adult social care service. Julian. Thank you, Chairman. Um, members will remember we debated part of this back in February. This is uh, an addition to that. Um, I don't plan to read out the recommendations, but principally they're in two areas. The existing charges for residential nursing home charges and non-residential charges, with the recommendation that we don't make any changes on those. Um, and then the new charges or new circumstances, um, and they are detailed in the recommendation one to six. Um, what I would say to point out is um, it's in conjunction with the Care Act, the fact that um, this council is under significant financial uh, pressures all the time. I'm sure Anthony's going to agree with that. Um, but the other point I would make is that the effect of this only comes in when someone has assets other than the house of more than 23,250. If the house is included, um, then obviously we can take that into account um, up to 70% equity loan to value, um, but with the family uh, making that decision on behalf of the person who's needing the care. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just firstly, a comment on recommendation three and four. Um, that uh, initially I recommend, uh, I, I, um, I'm pleased about the period of time for one year for not charging carers. I think that's um, a good period of time to assess um, how many proper carers we have in our community um, because I know that a number of them um, don't really register um, with us here. And um, I know that Health Watch recently did some work about assessing how many carers um, have mental health needs. <coughs> a member came forward out of the woodwork who we just hadn't recognised before. So um, I think that's 
this is this is very well <coughs> this is particularly. Um, secondly, around um, recommendation six C um, on page thirty, and then the reference to it on page thirty two, um, where it changes from seventy percent potentially to eighty percent with the um, with the director of health and wellbeing uh, potentially increasing this under exceptional circumstances. Um, would this be done um, in consultation or consent with the person receiving um, these services um, or with the carer or the family also um, if they were unable to make those decisions? Short answer is yes, and it will be at their behest, so they would actually request it. Uh, John? It's just, just one question, actually. Um, you talk about the amount of being exclusive of VAT. They are, they become, they're vatable now, not like that. Somebody they are battable, yes. Yeah, and, and I think that is actually sort of going to come to a shock to some people, but that is something that is outside our discretion and something that's set by the government. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll move straight to that. All those in favour, please show. See you now. <coughs> Moving on, page 77, procedure for dealing with special event, temporary closures on public rights of the AM. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Members, uh, for uh, regularly remembered. <coughs> um, each year we have, uh, for the Hendy Festival, uh, a paper coming to us to approve uh, really the temporary closure of public right of way. There has been local concern about this every year, uh, and it was agreed last year uh, that a working party would be formed to, to look at this to, to find some way that we could put into our regulations uh, a procedure um, that would provide more comfort to the local members. Very pleased that the Working Party uh, did sit, uh, and I thank you for that. They've come up with this recommendation, um, which will not only apply to, to that particular event, but any similar events, and provides for uh, the corporate, the consultation, which we already do, but, but it, it makes it uh, formal that we do it. Uh, I think it's as simple as that, Chair. Any questions or comments? I'll move straight to that. All those in favour of recommendations, page 77, please show. Right, that's unanimous. Again, to the last, this is the last item. Council and Companies Business. Uh, you have in front of you uh, the latest uh, report. Um, I do want to alert the executive to some changes in the directorship which will be incorporated into the next report. Um, mm -hmm. And since they've already happened, I take this opportunity to, to let you know. Uh, for Working on Housing Limited, um, uh, Councillor Gary Cowan is not going to have his uh, contract renewed. He's on a three year contract, as all um, non executive councillor directors are, apparently. Uh, his place will be taken by Councillor John Jarvis on a new three-year contract. The rationale for that is uh, John Jarvis' background is quantity surveyor, chartered builder. He's an expert witness, a qualified expert witness for any disputes between developers and clients in terms of costs, etc. So his profile is <laughs> absolutely spot on for um, uh, WHL, for the projects that have come, got coming up, like uh, um, uh, Phoenix and Foster's. Um, but we're not losing uh, Gary. Uh, he will be remaining on um, the Lodden Homes Limited, our um, registered social landlord, although it's not called that these days. Um, and he, what was it? Registered, registered provider. provider is the latest terminology. Um, he will be the chairman of that, so um, um, his planning skills and his experience and knowledge of WHL will not be less, uh, lost. Apart from that, um, lots of exciting things in here. If you've got any questions, um, we've got the Commissioner and we've got um, the uh, Commissioner for um, WHL, we've got the Commissioner for um, Applied, so if you've got any specific questions, uh, please answer them, ask them now. Uh, Chairman, it's not a specific question, but it's a, a statement regarding um, one of the points in here on, on page 82. 
Um, it's about recruitment and um, attention uh, for particularly for optimists. Um, we are also experiencing um, within uh, other parts of the council um, issues regarding um, recruitment. Um, we, we've done a lot of work within children's services and this has been particularly successful recently. Um, but um, particularly on uh, one area, we've been, uh, I've recently attended the children's um, children and young people's um, uh, partnership board and uh, the same day another board as well. And um, the same things were coming through that um, health were having these issues, social care at both, both adults, but also children's social care and other issues as well. And um, one of the key things was um, key worker housing would be difficult to um, you know, obtain here and, and not enough of it as well. Um, and teacher staff uh, trying to hang on to them. They would, they would come into this area, they would work for about three years and then, and then they would leave this area. Um, this, I believe, needs to be a key focus area for us uh, in order to continue um, growing our own, but actually retaining them beyond a few years here. Um, and um, I'd ask members around here to, to have a joint concerted effort um, with this piece of work going forward. Um, yes, to, before, I go, before I go to Anthony, um, it is a, a hot topic, you're absolutely spot on, and John is already looking at how we can maybe change some of the mix of affordable housing, etc., to key work. Worker housing, so he's got it quite high on his priority list, has he? Um, yes, I'm just following up that uh, we've raised it at um, Holka in the last two meetings and pressed for a um, uh, project uh, for Optus to, to be able to offer accommodation of some shape um, because we are going to have to go over two hours drive from working out to get some of these quite low paid stuff, and I suspect that offering some of these people accommodation is going to be critical. Um, uh, the issue of where they come from, either in the UK, um, and how we find them is, is a challenge. Um, and probably, you know, the other question is, do they have to come from overseas? And who knows? But it is something I think that's certainly brought to this. We need to find 60 people, new people next this year to do, to do the plan we want to do, and we'll probably do it in other cities next year. Um, and if you look at the wider uh, health and adult social uh, and, uh, and uh, children's services, there's probably even more. So it, it's going to be quite significant and we're going to be quite significant. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's one thing that I just want to come back on now. You know, we have Elevate, which is a great resource within our own community that we've recently set up. And um, you know, we need to continue to use that to advertise those positions, but also to inform um, young people um, about what those positions are, and also to say that you, you can actually train while you're getting your qualifications and, and get paid at the same time. So if you're going into a company like Optimist to learn how to, to be a carer, then you actually you get paid at the same time that you're doing your training and you shadow someone whilst you're doing it. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that information is necessarily out there. Um, you know, that you, you know, you can go straight from school if you wanted to, to do that. So I think it's, you know, that's useful to know that. Philip? Thank you, Chairman. Um, Chancellor Ola Karen Clark and I have regular meetings with the headmaster at uh, Embrook School. And in our last meeting two weeks ago, we were talking about the uh, Matthews Green SDL and the uh, affordable housing due to go there. And he made the comment himself that um, if they could have key worker accommodation earmarked on that location where the affordable housing is going along Tantley Road, he could simply add one sentence into his advertisements for teaching staff and he knows he would get far more applying than he does currently without being able to put that in. And he's, he made the point that you know, we really must start doing this now to retain or to obtain uh, good teaching staff in the working area because they simply cannot afford the accommodation as such at the moment, particularly younger ones, and it's, it's important we get them in and maintain that presence here. Okay. I'm, I'm sure John has got all that on his uh, radar. Uh, any other questions? I'll go straight to the um, recommendation on page 81. It's to note the budget new management position and the operational update. All those in favour, please share. Thank you. And I think... That is the last item on the agenda. Thank you very much for everyone and your attendance.